It is an illusion that secrets are walls. They are bridges waiting for us to uh, cross and share and grow. Welcome to today's convocation program at Carleton College. I'm your host, Kerry Rott, Director of Events. We will be together for one hour and we'll include time for questions. And you may submit your questions at any time and uh, just click on that Q&A tab on your screen. And then I can pose those questions to our guest speaker at the conclusion of his uh, presentation. Frank Warren is the most trusted stranger in America. In 2005, he created the Postscript post-secret project in which people anonymously mail to him their secrets on a homemade postcard. Selected secrets are then posted on the post-secret website. This growing collection of over a million artful secrets quickly became a worldwide phenomenon. The website has received more than 825 million views and has become the most visited ad-free blog in the world. It has also helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Warren's passionate commitment to mental health advocacy has taken him around the world to share what he has learned about our secret selves. At times hilarious and heartbreaking, the secrets reflect complex issues with which many of us struggle. Warren and the Post Secret Project demonstrate that by sharing these personal struggles, we can help each other and release our burdens. The title of his presentation today is Post Secret and Mental Health, Sharing Secrets, Reducing Stigma, Building Community. Mr. Warren, welcome. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for that introduction. This is gonna be fun. It's gonna be weird because I don't know if I'm here or there, but it's great that we're all together, uh, different states, different time zones, but weird can be fun. Um, during this presentation, I hope we can make it more of a conversation than a presentation. So please open up your chat box, ask questions, share secrets, make comments, whatever you wanna share during the uh, presentation is great. My name is Frank and I collect secrets. In 2004, I printed up 3000 self-addressed postcards just like this. They're blank on one side. The other side had some simple instructions inviting strangers to mail me their deepest confession. And they did. I received over a million and I brought some of the most extraordinary ones here to my office to share with you today. I think all of us kind of keep our secrets metaphorically in a box just like this. And every day, each one of us makes a choice about what to do with our box, whether to bury it down deep inside us and cover it and bury it and forget it, or to bring our box out into the light, open it and share our secrets like gifts. This is an example of a postcard I got a while ago. It's got a drawing on it, my home address on the back, some stamps. Almost every secret I get has a picture, collage, photograph, something graphic that further conveys the emotion behind the secret. This one has, looks like an elevator schematic. And the secret says, I feel too when I take elevators one floor, so I limp when I get out. <laughs> this is one that came two days ago. This one came, here's, here's the picture side. And the other side reads, Dear passengers, I judge you for going on vacations during a pandemic from your flight attendant. This one has a, a couple under a tree branch. Simply says, I didn't enlist to escape you. I enlisted to pay for our wedding. Will you marry me? Here's one on the other side of the emotional spectrum. It says, I work at a veterinary clinic when euthanizing a pet, we give you the option of staying in the room with them or leaving. Always stay. They look for you once you're gone. There's a happier secret.
And finally, this one, it's got some flowers, it says BFF. It says, when my husband cheated on me, my best friend told me I was, if I was meeting all his needs, he wouldn't be cheating on me. After my divorce, I had sex with her husband. <laughs> So you can see the full range uh, of what people are opening up and sharing courageously through these vulnerable visual haikus on postcards. In 2004, I had a crazy idea to invite strangers to mail me their secrets. So I printed up these postcards. After work, I would walk to downtown and hand them to strangers on the street and say, hi, I'm collecting secrets. It felt as weird as it sounds. But slowly, secrets began to find their way to my mailbox. Let's see if I can share my screen. I hope you can see Kathy there. She is the MVP of Post Secret. Early on in the project, Kathy asked me if I could enlarge my mailbox because I was getting so many postcards. You can see it's, it's super sized there in the picture. I asked Kathy once if she had a favorite secret of the thousands she had delivered in there, tens of thousands. She said she did. It was a secret that said, I used to work at the post office and we used to read everybody's postcards. Are you guys doing that? I, I think that's Kathy's answer right there to that question. One of my first surprises was they were coming from all over the world. When the postcards came to my mailbox, I would scan them and post them on the web at postsecret.com, the Sunday secrets. Maybe some of you have visited the website before. And very quickly, uh, the website went viral. The first Sunday, 100 people visited. The next Sunday, 1,000. The Sunday after that, 100,000. As the idea spread around the world, people began to buy their own postcards and make their own postcards. And they, they were arriving with postmarks, not just from US cities, but from Ireland and New Zealand and France and Canada. Um, sometimes they would come in languages I couldn't even identify. One secret was written in French and it said, I'm mailing this card because I get the feeling that I could meet the person who will change my life on the way to the post office. It was around this time my wife started getting nervous because I was putting our home address all over the web on the cover of books. I tried to convince her it wouldn't last long. We wouldn't get that many secrets. My original goal was to receive 365 postcards, but this is my secret collection today. That's my wife struggling to stack a brick of 300 postcards on a pyramid of well over a million. What I'd like to do in this short amount of time that we have is take you on an extraordinary journey to the heart of this archive and share the most amazing, soulful, funny secrets I've ever received. I received one postcard about three months into the project that changed everything for me. It kind of helped me realize maybe why I started this project in the first place. You can see it in this picture. It's in the lower right hand corner. It says, the holes are from when my mom tried knocking down my door so she could continue beating me. This was a postcard made out of a photograph of a broken bedroom door. And when I received it, I scanned it, I posted it on the web, and I wasn't ready for what happened next. That day, a million people visited the website and other young people started emailing me their stories, their pictures of their broken bedroom doors. And as each one arrived, I put it up on the web. Soon there were over a dozen pictures of broken bedroom doors on the web. And the emails that came with these secrets would break your heart even more. I remember one from a girl, she wrote, Dear Frank, seeing all these pictures of broken bedroom doors, it doesn't depress me because all this time I, I was the only one. And just knowing there are other people out there like me who share my secret, it doesn't make my secret go away, but it lets my burden feel just a little bit lighter. And then I got a picture of a broken bedroom door that reminded me that when I was young, 
I had one of these doors too. And it really helped understand that there are two kinds of secrets. There are the secrets that we keep from others and the ones we hide from ourselves. And when I uncovered that part of my past I had buried, I wrote it on a postcard, mailed it to myself, talked to my family about it, and I share it at live events like today. So maybe the real reason I started this project is because just as much as everybody else, I needed that safe, non-judgmental place to reconcile with parts my past I was hiding from. Thanks for hearing this. Uh, this postcard you can see uh, was made out of a Starbucks cup. There's stamps and my home address on the back. If you take nothing else away from the presentation, today, the one thing you should always remember is always treat your servers and wait staff with the respect and kindness they deserve because they will get the last laugh, believe me. This is a picture of objects that were mailed to me with secrets written on them. It was an exhibit in the Smithsonian and you can see that the post office calls these naked mail, uh, objects mailed with stamps and an address. You can't read all the secrets. I'll, I'll share a couple of them with you. On the coconut, the secret says, I feel closest to God when wading the waters of the ocean. On the green roller skate, the secret reads, roller derby saved my soul. On the plate, it says, mom, I hate your boyfriend and refuse to eat off his plates. <laughs> and the balloon, there's a small deflated helium balloon, says, when we decided to keep you, your life was the only one saved. In the upper right hand corner, there's a canvas, a painting that was mailed to me as is. And for a long time, I really didn't understand what the secret was. It was a mystery. There were no words on it, front or back. That's the whole secret, what you see right there. What imagine the secret is for that one? I wish all secrets could be fun secrets. Ha ha, he he. Um, I should say this program that most of the programs I receive are not fun. Uh, they're heavy. You know, the good things in our life, we can't wait to put on Instagram or Facebook or tell a friend. But it's the stories that connect with shame and stigma that we bury, that we don't talk, pretend don't exist. But if we can find the courage to be vulnerable, expose, that part of who we really are, it allows for the kind of intentions that can make life so much more worth living. This one, um, it reminds me of an email I got from somebody connected to the idea of exposure and nakedness and connection. She wrote this, my boyfriend and I knew we had to do something important or else our relationship would fall apart. So we took markers and wrote our deepest secrets on each other's backs. I never read his secrets and he never read mine, but the perilousness of such close contact between us and the other's demons was what we needed to save our relationship. I have 11 secrets that I've never told to anyone. It's both my biggest fear and my greatest desire to find someone I trust enough to share all of them with. This is the second common secret I get. The most common secret mailed to me is I pee in the shower. <laughs> Besides I pee in the shower, it's this. And when I say this secret, I don't mean this exact confession, but the idea behind it. The idea that so many of us are someplace on that journey, trying to find that one person who we can be our full and true and authentic selves with. That's a secret I see written dozens of different ways on postcards every week. One of these men is the father of my maybe torn away son. He pays me a lot to keep it a secret. A message I wish I had known when I was in college and feeling alone and in high school when I felt without direction. But it's also, I think, applicable during the pandemic as well. My dad told me that this sign meant there were no at outlet malls at the end of the street. I believed him until I was 12. <laughs> I received dozens of secrets like this, basically lies that a parent, typically a father, tells their kids. 
Another example would be uh, my dad told me that if I pulled enough weeds out the front lawn, eventually a koi would come out of roots. My mom told me that chocolate milk only came from brown cows. Told me that when the ice cream truck played music, it meant they'd run out of ice cream. But some uh, stories are heartwarming too. One woman shared, I was a little girl, my dad would take his ladder and put it on the lawn every summer night and bring me outside and tell me he'd put the moon up for me. He passed away a few years ago and every night we'll see the moon, I think of him. This year, more American soldiers will be killed by their own hands than by any enemy. Statistically, every year, or thousands take their own lives. The Surgeon General has said that suicide is the most preventable form of death in this country. We know what we can do to help. We know, it was, we know that by attacking the stigma, shame, of grits that can prevent young people for, from asking for the help they need. We know that can save lives. We know that be taught by talking about our story and not feeling isolated, uh, working through our depression, not uh, knowing we're not alone. We know that can save lives too. More than once I've received emails from students who say the only reason I'm alive today is because my coach, my Professor, my friend, asked me at just the right time. This secret reads, you doing okay? Sure. Really? What can I do for you? I don't know. Please let me know. Okay. I'm seriously worried about you. Don't be. I can be if I want. Uh, if you turn over this card, you can't see it. But in the upper right-hand corner, the person wrote, my friend doesn't read it but this conversation saved my life. 67% of students will tell a friend they're hurting before they'll tell a parent or a psychologist or a teacher. And that sounds like a lot of pressure if you're that friend, but you don't have to be a professional to help. You just need to be a good friend. There's a simple acronym, V-A-R, validate, appreciate, refer. If a friend comes to you talking about feeling all the pressure from being in a competitive academic environment or the pandemic or isolation, anxiety, whatever it might be, the first thing is to validate those feelings. I'm glad you shared them with me. It's not surprising somebody in those, your circumstances would feel that way. You are brave to tell me that. The second thing is uh, appreciate, A. Um, let the person know that you are there for them. Seven, if they need help, you've been through time. You can get through it together. And then lastly, the R, V-A-R is refer. Help the person find a, a resource on campus, um, a crisis hotline, counselor. Uh, your tuition pays for those resources. There is always hope and help regardless as to how your depression or isolation might be lying. You don't, don't believe those stories. The last thing I say about this card makes me proud. And that is the post secret community as a whole has raised over a million dollars for suicide prevention and created the most complete and comprehensive database of suicide prevention hotlines in the world. Uh, it's uh, the post secret suicide prevention wiki. So if you are part of either one of those efforts, thank you. Here is that acronym again, VR, validate, appreciate, refer. And Active Minds Online has a lot more resources about how you can be there for a friend or family member. His temper is so scary that I've lost all of my opinions. When I post this on the web, I got a lot of response, including this. Do you know that I left my boyfriend of a year a postcard that read, his temper is so scary, I've lost all my opinions. It hadn't even occurred to me what was happening and it took a total stranger writing it down to me realize what the hell was going on in my life. I cannot thank you enough for making things so much clearer. It was the smartest thing I've done in a long time. Indeed. 
When people I love leave voicemails on my phone, I always save them in case they die tomorrow. No other way of hearing their voice ever again. When I posted the secret on the web, a dozen people emailed me final voicemail messages they'd been saving on their phones, sometimes for years, from friends and family members who had passed away. They said that by preserving and sharing those final messages, it allowed to keep the spirit of their loved ones alive. A woman shared with me the last song she ever heard her grandmother sing to her, along with this email. Dear, after grandmother passed away, I saved a voicemail of her singing, it's somebody's birthday today. It means a lot that she always called on my birthday to sing me this song. This particular song, this recording is still sent out to every member of my family on their birthday. First safe voice message. It's somebody's birthday today. Somebody's birthday today. A candles I like it. Somebody's cake. And we're all invited for somebody's sake. Happy birthday, my Patty. You're 21 years old today. Have a real happy birthday. This is Grandma Hartman. And I love you. I'll for now. When I hear that final recording, it's it's always emotional. And maybe it's because it reminds not to take for those special people still in our lives. Before my grandmother passed away a few years ago, with my phone, I recorded this four-generation conversation between her, my mom, my wife, and my daughter. And other people have shared their, their phone-related secrets with me. One guy said, if my wife knew all the secrets on my phone, two marriages would be destroyed. Another woman shared, I secretly keep the phone number to the suicide prevention hotline under speed dial names like Dave and Art and Kristen and Dennis. One woman said, uh, I still have the password to my ex-boyfriend's email account. And sometimes I go online and read his emails and they really pissed me off. And then I messaged my guy who said, I know my ex-girlfriend still has my password. Sometimes I write emails just to piss her off, <laughs> who could be related. But maybe my favorite would be live post secret of a woman came to a microphone in front of hundreds of people. And she said, sometimes walk across campus I see something coming towards me I don't want to talk to. Pull out my phone and pretend I'm having a conversation as I walk on by. She kind of hurried back to her seat after that. She looked embarrassed, called her out. I said, look, no shame, no stick. Nobody's alone with your secret. It just feels like it. I asked the audience, who here has done that before? If, you, if anybody here has done that before, put it in the chat box. Uh, let us know if you've done that before because... Even though people feel like they're alone with their secret, they're not. You, know, you keep a secret and they feel like this wall that's separating you from others. But if we can let it go, uh, we, we can recognize that secret as a bridge, connect us to others, connecting us to our deepest self. So what I want to do now is share with you some other phone-related secrets. Uh, so the post-secret, and this is an example of one of those confessions. I recently got a job as a full-time babysitter. Parent that I am their adopted daughter's birth mother. I didn't know either until her baby picture, the one I sent them before they adopted her. Today, I found out my family secret. My grandfather was gay and the only person who knew was my amazing grandma. They raised a family together. They were best friends. When people get close, I start coughing. Funny how fast they move. I'm in the waiting room about to start treatment for depression and anxiety. I'm finally the help I need. I, I can relate to this one. For the, during the pandemic, I've had to reach out for help. Um, and I'm glad that family and physicians were there to be there to support. 
I used to be a little bit racist until my grandson taught me how to love. I was raped and you know what? I'm gonna be all right. Every time I drive past a strip club, I scream, dad, hoping that the guy walking in will feel horrible and run away. So those were some secrets shared via phone. What I wanna do now is share with you some confessions that have arrived over the past few weeks and months. I've never received so many secrets about one topic as I have about the pandemic. Here we go. First, a statistic, 89% uh, of college students are experiencing stress or anxiety as a result of COVID-19. Certainly a stat that I don't need to share with students. I'm trying real hard not to do this and the panic button. Seems like this postcard might have arrived recently, but no, this arrived at the very beginning of the pandemic, but it seems like it's applicable right now as well. At the beginning of the pandemic, it seemed kind of like we were all in it together. There, there was a sense of adventure. We were, we were focused outward, not inward. Remember making uh, face masks, drive-by birthday parties. Remember this guy? <laughs> yeah, now we're kind of in the second phase of this pandemic. With all disasters, uh, whether it's Katrina or 9-11, there is phase at the beginning where it's a bit easier. As the days go on, the weeks pass, the months go by, you know it's gonna end, you just don't know when. There's another period where it gets rough and difficult. First it was the of the sprint and now this marathon. So no more than ever, it's important to take care of ourselves and to keep our eyes on others to make sure they're good. I never wished wide pandemic, I don't have to go on vacation with you anymore. <laughs> I think, you know, during the pandemic, it's not all bad. There are definitely pandemics. Uh, I think this is one, and you might have some pandemic wins in your life. Maybe you can share them in the chat. I know things are going to get worse, but right now my biggest problem is finding the privacy masturbate. I, I wasn't going to include them, but all of our stories are important. So I definitely wanted to honor our story, our secret. It's a worldwide pandemic and I'm starting an affair. Perhaps a pandemic win, I'll decide. I love hanging with you a little too much. This is one I can relate to. I've uh, been drinking more than I would otherwise during the pandemic. And so uh, this is a focus for me. I'll share that with all struggling in our own ways. We don't need the big fancy wedding. Thank the reminder, COVID-19. This is an opportunity to, to take a different perspective on matters in our life and have a new appreciation for some things we might not otherwise. Just tell me you feel overwhelmed, depressed, unmotivated, tell them I understand. They don't know what I feel. They don't know that I feel the exact same way. This effing sucks from your school counselor. It's okay not to feel okay. And sometimes it's the people who are there for us the most who need our help too. So during this time, um, I think it's important to understand our own feelings going through this, but also be sent to others, offer help when we can. No one should have to watch their grandpa's funeral on. I can't imagine more grief or loss. It does bring this idea of how we all experience grief and loss. We're all in a pandemic together. You know, we're all in the same storm, but each of us is in our own boat and our experience is different, but that doesn't make it any less. So whether you've had a significant loss or like me, you were disappointed about out on some family vacations, or maybe you had this idea 
of how college was going to be. And it's now something different. And there's some anger connected with that. Honor your loss. You're feeling valid, even though they might not be as severe as somebody who suffered greater loss. This conversation came up on social media. And I just messaged from somebody that I thought was really on target. I tell my students that the fact that others have it worse doesn't invalidate your feelings. Yes, people are dying, but that doesn't mean you can't cry or be angry over your losses, whatever they may be. By allowing ourselves to experience our emotions, we begin to care for our souls again. And this is another uh, meme that popped up in the social media. When you find out your normal daily lifestyle is called quarantine. I had a birthday during the pandemic and it, it was great. So maybe I'm this character too. Do you think AA is about finishing the 12 steps? It's not. It's about sharing the struggles of following the steps with others. I'm scared. There's a lot to this secret. For I focus on the last two words, I'm scared. One of the things I've in the pandemic is remove myself from the feelings and experiences so that I have some room to manage the feelings. So for example, if, if, if I catch myself feeling anxious, I won't say I'm anxious. I'll put some separation in there and I'll identify something that connects it. So I'd say, I notice when I watch much news, I, I have feelings of anxiety. For me, I think if we can feel it, label it, and talk about it, it helps us process our feelings in a way that's much more manageable. We've, we've got to feel before we can heal. I miss touch more than I miss sex. I constantly reach out, check everyone's okay, not just because I care, but because I'm afraid no one will think to check on me. The ones you think are strong are struggling too. Let's try this experiment. If, uh, take out your phone and open up a browser and do a Google search for this. Call makes me feel. See how Google auto completes this query. It's going to be surprising. And what's surprising about it is. The responses you get right now are the same responses that were coming up a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. This isn't just pandemic related. When you type in college makes me feel, you're gonna see autocompletes, a failure, worthless. You know, people might have told you that the college is the best years of your life and maybe parts of it, but there are also some of the greatest struggles. And know this, if you're feeling a burden right now, whatever you might be, you're not alone. There's hope. There's help. People want to be there. And maybe you can be there for someone else. The last part of my talk, where I finished in a couple of minutes, is about self-care, not being selfish or superficial. Before we can be there for others, we have to be there for ourselves. And I've received a lot of interesting thing secrets about that from people. During COVID-19, I tip outrageously. It may feel lucky. I've been searching Amazon baby registries and sending gifts to strangers since they didn't get to have baby showers. My mantra is lovingly aggressive friend, right? The only thing getting me through quarantine can't see it, but on the other side, the person wrote, like, if you don't know what this is, it's weird. <laughs> and if it's legal or a, a possible. I'm learning that grief and joy can overlap. Thank goodness. 30-year-old male about to grab a beer and take a bubble bath. It was a rough day. For my own self, I created this portrait. My girlfriend. She's a nurse. Like, sitting in your car outside of your house is self-care. I can't explain it, but if you know, no. 60% of students are still hopeful or extremely hopeful about their future. 
And finally, I want to end back where I started with that portrait in the upper right-hand corner. Over the months, I think I know with this secret, the person who painted this is telling us all that they found that person who accepts them fully, who they don't have to keep any secrets from. And so maybe they don't have to send any more seats on postcards anymore. Free your secrets and become who you are. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. And we do have some folks here who have uh, mentioned that uh, when passing someone, uh, they pretend to be talking on the phone. So yes, <laughs> others have done it. Um, and one person says, now every time I walk past someone I know and they're talking on the phone, I'm gonna wonder if they're pretending to be on the phone to avoid me. Uh, but one question we have here is, do you personally read everything that is sent to you? Yes, I read every postcard, I keep every secret. Um, I think it's a very precious archive for sure. Unfortunately, I'm not able to post all because I get so many. Uh, I post about 10 new ones every Sunday. Sometimes postcards make it into the post secret books or in an art exhibit. Just the process is what the person was looking for in the first place, you know, just getting your secret out of you onto a postcard and then physically letting it go to a stranger. I hope that rich can be cathartic. What other questions uh, might you have out there in the audience for uh, Frank? Somebody said, I remember about three people from my days at Carleton. The ones I think of the most is uh, Roger Eldridge, the counselor. And what are the uh, first steps to forming a more emotional connection with the people around you? Hmm. Um, well, a trick that works for me, I'll say trick, uh, live events. Uh, I would never ask audience members to share a secret with before I shared one of mine. So I think that by being vulnerable, uh, you encourage other people to open up and really tell you what's on there too. So I mean, you know, if you're a parent and you want to hear some, some secrets or some inner thoughts from your children, I think uh, the approach is open up with them about your secrets and inner thoughts. And that invitation often allows you to build a rapport uh, that's, that's really meaningful and special. Someone says, on a metaphysical level, do you think that the mass of secrets you hold for us all is extremely heavy or all, overall is it light? Oh, I love that question. Um, well, sometimes I think of the secrets of, I like similar to dark matter in the universe. Like over the past five or 10 years, we've discovered that most of the matter in the universe is dark. We cannot see it. We can only observe its effects on other bodies. 80% of the universe maybe. I think we have that inside of us too. We, we keep these secrets that, that it's like dark matter. It impacts our beliefs, our relationship, our behavior in ways we don't understand until we can shine light on it and understand it. But you also asked about burdening. Um, I think can metaphorically be burdens. There was an article a few years ago, I think in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, talking about people who harbor significant secrets, a secret like cheating on a spouse or hiding your sexual orientation. And the study said that for people carrying those kinds of burdens, it's like a physical uh, burden on their body. They said, that those people, when they identify the steepness of a mountain, if they're carrying a secret, they see the mountain as being steeper. If you're carrying a secret, you're more likely to get sick because your immune system is compromised. 
If you're a big secret, less likely to help a friend who asks for help because you feel so burdened already. Um, I don't know if I physically or metaphysically carry those burdens, but I will say since I started this project, I had two back surgeries. So maybe that says something. And a related question, uh, receiving so many secrets, how do you maintain or recover from not being able to actively help the people who are sharing the secrets that are so hard? Oh, what a message, compassionate message. Um, before I started Post Secret, I was a volunteer on two side prevention hotlines. So before getting secrets on postcards, I was hearing them on the phone at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Um, and as you answer that phone, it's interesting. You're trained not to solve problems. You're trained to simply listen in a non-judgmental, compassionate way. And so I, I try and focus on that when people know their secrets to me. My, my hope is that's the first step in a longer journey, reconciling with it, confession, whatever it might be. Or maybe by sharing that secret, they're helping a hundred other people, a thousand other people feel not alone with their burdens. So, yeah, I, I think that that's what I try and focus on. And then the last thing would be when I was young, I had secrets, uh, secrets that no young person should have to carry and feel alone with. And so I was at this project allows other young people to understand, even if they have a pretty heavy secret, they're sharing that burden with many other people. They're not isolated. And sometimes that in and of itself can be a big relief. Has anyone had difficulties because their secret after being posted online was identified by someone in their life? These are questions, I'm coming. The answer is yes. I received a postcard from a woman who wrote, I worked all my life into Harvard and now that I'm here, I hate it. I posted it. Two days later, I got an email from her. She identified what was on the back of the card, so I knew it was her. And she said, Frank, my friends and family know it's my secret. I'm getting all kinds of grief. Can you please remove it? I took it down, but I emailed her back and I said, you know, even though you feel this pressure term in your life right now, maybe over the long run, outing that story, that secret might be really healthy if it helps you find a new place on campus that's a better fit or transfer to a school you like better. And I think that's a pattern. Um, secrets can be painful initially when we let them out, but over the long run, they might be the healthiest thing we can do. Someone has said, thank you for an inspiring talk. Someone has said, I've been following your site for years that has gotten me through some tough times. Thank you. Uh, someone here has said, thank you so much for this work. I've been a fan for years. When my partner and I first got together eight years ago, we'd look at Sunday Secrets every week together. It taught us a lot about each other and through how we relate to others. Project you, helps me too. Thank have you, you, Darren. Have you gotten, gotten similar uh, responses like that? How do we gain the courage to share? Oof, yeah. I think sharing is an act of faith and maybe it's like a muscle that we can grow stronger over time and through courage. I would suggest baby steps, you know, maybe easier to run on postcards and burn at first, or maybe it's easier to go for a long walk in the woods and with your secret to a tree. And then step by step, maybe there are others in your social circle who you can trust and share with. And what's really gratifying is as you start taking those steps, the people in your circle of trust will start sharing more of themselves. And those connections and that intimacy is what can make life much more meaningful. And while other folks are thinking about questions that they would like to pose, could you uh, tell us again the address for Post Secrets for those that don't have that? Yeah, I'll hold up a postcard and maybe just take a screenshot. Great. And if you still want the address, just go to postsecret.com. You can see about 30 postcards there and the address. 
All right. Do you ever worry that the sharing is performative? How do you think publishing a selection in books and on your site affect a person's decision to share? Interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I guess it can be performative. Um, at the same time, I think even if you're making something up, it has to come from a, a deep hide you. When you're talking about anonymous secrets, I think that's, that's a very interesting thing because I would argue that if I asked you to tell me a secret and then I asked you to make up a secret, the secret that you make up, I think, probably is more connected and more deep than the secret you're telling us yourself because it has to come from somewhere. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. Think of anonymity as being something that is, is separate from truth finding in a sense. For example, you read a newspaper, you want to know who the reporter is, you want to know who the sources are. If it's anonymous, it's questionable. At the same time, sometimes you can get deeper levels of truth if you include anonymous sources, including yourself. So I would challenge you, I would say, you know, write down some secrets in your life and then quickly make up some secrets out of the blue and see if those secrets you just made up have some sort of deeper connection to who you are. Because my belief is that we all have secrets and we find a sufficient amount of courage to dig down so deep, but there's always secrets deeper and deeper and deeper that are waiting for us to find the courage to dig a little deeper. Someone has said, I, I heard or I learned a secret about my family decades after it happened and was able to discuss it with my dad. It helped me understand my family my sister didn't want to hear it and I never discussed it with my mom as I felt it wouldn't, she wouldn't deal with it well. Not so much a question, but an observation that not everyone wants to know and acknowledge. Family secrets are complicated. They're like knots that can tie us up. Uh, who owns the secret? If I tell this family secret, is it exposing another family member where they would not want that shared? Um, when I was growing up, we had family secrets. And later on in life, I learned that my parents had secrets they were keeping from me. So maybe that is a seed that started this fascination with secrets that I have. But yeah, of all secrets, I think family secrets are the most knotted up. Do you ever get... Uh follow-up questions from people who have sent you their secrets? Yeah, not necessarily questions, but rest of the story explanations. So that happens quite a bit. Yeah, uh, around Christmas time, I got this secret from somebody that was exposing their bitter aunt's pie recipe. They had an aunt in the family for generations who had a secret recipe that she never shared with anybody in the family until the very end. And somehow this person got access to it and she kept it secret until the aunt passed away. And then she shared it on a card. There were dozens of people in the post year community making this pie and taking pictures of it and sharing. One couple used it as a, as a proposal. And so uh, the original share of that responded back and she was tickled that community had really uh, done so much with this secret in a positive way. What do you think happens in situations where secrets are never revealed? Yeah, I think we keep secrets for different reasons. Um, sometimes we keep secrets to protect other people, their feelings. Um, some secrets so we don't expose too much of ourselves. I think sometimes if we keep too many secrets, we rob ourselves of our one opportunity to live a full and true and authentic life. 
So the stakes can be very high. Uh, my message would always be uh, share more secrets than you feel comfortable with, but don't share all of them. Here's somebody who has written, I can write poetry, but if I try to write fiction, I become aware that some of my secrets are in the story. And I'm afraid the reader who knows me personally will then know me better than I want them to. It's very inhibiting. I believe I am many years late in getting a pen name. <laughs> that sounds really insightful. Yeah, there's probably some solutions there. You could, you could write anonymously. Um, you could write for your own edification. Or maybe, you know, as you age, you're going to care less and less what others think about you, about who you are a little bit more so that if somebody reads something you wrote and they think a sway about you because of it, it's not going to affect you as much as it would if you hadn't told your truth, your story. So there's definitely still time left. I would say keep writing. The question, do you think some secrets are meant to be taken to the grave? Wow. Maybe. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, recently we've had some really interesting advances with DNA and we can actually understand how many children come from uh, the DNA of a parent who's, who they don't think is their parents. For example, we know, let's see how many people we have in this. How many people do we have with us today? I don't see the number, like 80, oh, 85? Yeah, we've got 85 to 100 come and go. Yeah. Okay. So statistically, in the U.S., two of you right now watching me have a parent that's different than who you think your biological parents are. That's a huge, that's really significant. Um, and it's statistically and evidence-based statistically. Kind of a mind blower. Uh, maybe like that. If you're honoring the well-being of your child, you take that to your grave. Um, I, I can certainly see holding secrets for the benefit of others, even if it's not healthy for you. Well, we've come to the end of our time, and this has been indeed moving and motivating for us. So do you have a closing comment that you could share with our audience today? things I've learned through Post Secret is that everybody has at least one secret that could break your heart if you knew what it was. And if we just feel the truth of, it, I think it allows us more compassion, more understanding, and maybe even have more accepted empathy for ourselves. So that's what I'd leave you with. Well, thank you again, Mr. Warren. And thank you all for joining us. Please tune in again next week when contemporary civil rights icon Bree Newsom will show and talk to us about how ordinary people can make extraordinary difference for social change. Thank you. Bye.